woke up this morning and was doing really well. And then I went out on the porch to take our dog outside about six o'clock. And this uh, pain started going down my leg. It just won't seem to ease up. So, but when I sit, it seems to be a little bit better. So if y'all uh, would uh, indulge me another week or so, maybe uh, I'll be able to stand again. But uh, for today, I uh, think I'll sit here if that's okay with everybody. All right. All uh, right. Seemed to work out okay last week. Um, maybe it will this week also. Uh, I don't have a table, but I got a pew. It's, uh, it's, it works pretty good. And I'm going to do my best uh, not to wave my hands as much as I waved them last week because I was kind of, uh, you know, when I'm standing up there behind the pulpit, I can grab a hold of the pulpit and that gives me something to do with my hands. Um, a lot of times when you're speaking, you, you just don't know what to do with your hands. And uh, so I'm going to try to do better with that today. I, uh, I want to talk to you a, a little bit uh, this morning about Father's Day. We uh, We think about uh, the scripture that we read from James chapter 5. Didn't sound too much like an encouraging, uplifting Father's Day message was going to come out of that. Uh, it was uh, a warning uh, to people, mainly rich people. James was uh, directing that specifically at unbelievers. But I think the message is just as pertinent for, for believers as well. You know, James is talking uh, about those that were obsessed with the accumulation of wealth. Now, Accumulation of wealth in itself, nothing wrong with that. It's the obsession with it that causes people to cross the line. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, uh, shared some thoughts on that. Um, it said uh, along the lines of of gathering wealth to uh, save all you can, work all you can, gather all you can, gain all you can, save all you can so that you can share all that you can. He didn't want you to get rich for the sake of getting rich. He wanted Christians to get rich or I'd say wealthy. Because the more money you have, the more people that you can help. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. James also warns uh, about being unfair to people. And I think uh, and we touched on that in Sunday school this morning. It's everywhere. Everywhere you turn, you see people getting mistreated or oppressed or abused in some way or another. And I guess one question this, that I have this morning for us is how much is enough? How much is enough? You know, when I think uh, 
of us celebrating Father's Day today. Um, certainly this is, uh, we can focus this as the man being the head of the household. Of course, if you say that too loud in today's day and time, somebody will really ridicule you and get on to you. See, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s in a time of the women's lib movement, women's liberation. Didn't really understand it very much, but I heard a lot about it. Saw it on TV, heard a lot of people talk about it. But you know, I think there's uh, something to be said for that. Um, uh, you hear about equality, discrimination. You know, it's kind of hard for us to fathom and I didn't look it up because I thought I'd know it and I think I'm right. But I think that women received the right to vote in 1914. I may be off a little bit, but I think I'm close. Think about that. That's 100 years ago. Up until 100 years ago or thereabouts, women could not vote. That's kind of hard to imagine. I know back in those days, it, it wasn't proper for women to do a lot of things. Uh, smoking in public, drinking in public, doing whatever, those kind of things just wasn't, uh, you know. Back in those days, a, women, a woman's place was in the home, raising children. The world's different now. You know, I look around the room here and I see, I guess, most every woman here has had a career out there in, in the workplace. So it's, it's a little different world. You know, James, and I'm going to read some scripture from Timothy also, you know, they were mainly talking to the men of the day. And, and, and we're going to talk to the men of today. But that certainly doesn't excuse or make women immune from any of the subjects that we're going to talk about today. Because let's be realistic. You know, we live in a world where women can be just as greedy as men. In some and many, most situations, women can be just as powerful as men. So this is really for everybody. But it's something for us to consider. And what it all boils down to is whether it's a man or a woman, whether it's Mother's Day or Father's Day, it's, it all boils down to how we treat one another. That's what it all boils down to. As we said last week, it's where the rubber meets the road. You know, James mentions the wealthy accumulating wealth and mistreating people. But I want to read to you, as I mentioned, scripture from 1 Timothy, chapter 6. Probably one of the most misquoted scriptures in the Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 10, it says, If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies, quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we could take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. 
Now here, verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. How many times in our lives have we heard people say that money is the root of all evil? A lot of people criticize money. Well, Scripture is very clear. Money in itself is not evil. And people leave this fact out. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's that obsession with it. Money becomes our God. When money becomes more important than what should be. The love of money. We see it everywhere. So many people are affected by it. Timothy tells us it causes us to be conceited, quarrelsome, Produces envy, strife, malicious talk, constant friction. It corrupts our minds. It's that same greed that James was talking about that that we that we label bad employers with. Could be politicians. Could be stewards of God's money. We just never know. You know, in the news, we hear bad stuff all the time. And from time to time, we'll get in conversations, as we did this morning a little bit, about greedy or corrupt politicians. And with Ronald being, uh, having a background in uh, municipal government, um, you know, he he has caused me to take pause in my judgmental attitude. And I think he's right in that the fact that not all politicians are bad. And I think that's accurate. I think probably, I don't know the exact percentage, but I think um, we hear about that one bad apple and the other 99 in the basket that are doing a great job have our best interests at heart. We never hear about them. You know, we go back to the corruption with televangelists. I mean, I was younger. I don't know if this is 20, 30 years ago or so. We go back to the Jim Baker days, to the um, uh, Jimmy Swagger days. You know, and, and you hear about those, but you don't hear about the, the tens of thousands of millions of preachers that are out there working hard every day trying to do what's right. You hear about the bad ones. Because that's what sells advertising on television and newspapers. But the fact of the matter is, is there is corruption, and there is evil, and there is wrongdoing everywhere we look. It's out there. And when you get right down to it, the the cause of a lot of it, it all boils down to being greedy, which stems from that, that evil disease called the love of money. 
Now, we all realize that money is a necessity. We have to have it to live. You, know, you can't have lights without it. You can't have water without it. You can't have food without it. You can't have a roof over your head without it. It's just one of those things. But I think coming about it honestly and not being obsessed with it, taking what God sends our way and being content with that is what I think God wants for each one of us. But it's when we cross that line and, and money becomes an obsession, we... We become obsessed. We have that love of money when it come, becomes more important than anything. When it becomes the most important thing. James tells us that God has heard the cries of the people. And if you're one of those people that have been wronged or oppressed or mistreated or cheated, you may be thinking that God hadn't heard soon enough. And I know that I have been guilty of standing back and looking up at the sky and, and saying, God, why is this happening to me? Where is... Where is the justice for me? You know, why am I being allowed to be mistreated like this? It does happen. But then I try my best to catch myself and realize that, that God will intervene in his time. His will always is done. One thing that really struck me in what James said, God hears the cries of his people. He knows the mistreatment because God is watching. God sees everything. God hears everything. God knows everything. And you know, when you get right down to it, if you've got a conscience, that's the scary part. I can only imagine those people that are doing the mistreating do their best to ignore the fact that God is watching. But at one point in time, at some point in time in their lives, they will be held to account for that. You know, as a, a manager in a business here in Gadsden, uh, I interviewed several people this week. And uh, some of those folks that I interviewed this week were desperate. And I said, uh, you know, I asked them the question. I said, what is, is your... Um, what is your goal for the next three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months. And, uh, and, and we talked about that. And, and, and the general theme among everyone that I talked to was, man, I just need a job. You know, I, I, have, I have career goals and aspirations, but man, I just need a job. And I can tell you what, what I heard in their voice this week was desperation. I mean, they would have come to work for any wage that I offered them, I believe. I had them proverbially hanging over a barrel. And... So I had the ability to offer them a fair wage or I could have reduced that 
by a percentage which would have increased the profits of our bottom line. And I can just tell you that with a clear conscience, I offered them what I felt like was a fair wage. I paid them what I think was probably more than they accepted. And I'm not saying that to, to make myself sound good or make you think higher of me. I'm just sharing with you a fact. And those, the thoughts and the idea of our scripture went through my mind when I was talking to them and I made that decision. You know, I could have cut them all a dollar or two an hour and offered them less, but I didn't. I offered them what I thought was a fair wage. And I thought that by doing that, and I felt like, and that's kind of the way that I try to operate in my secular job, is as I go by what the guidelines of what's right and wrong according to the Bible. Not according to our hiring guidelines of the laws of the state of Alabama or our company. I try to do what's right. Because you see, in my line of work, I have three owners of Gadsden Fabrication. And theoretically, I work for them. They are my bosses. But in reality, my boss is the Lord God Almighty upstairs. That's who I work for. That's who I'm truly accountable to. And that's how I try to to operate and conduct myself. So as men on Father's Day and women, how do we treat one another? Not just employees, but just, just everyone that we're coming in contact with. About a month ago, Ronald offered a challenge to us to be helpful and nice and positive to people that we come in contact with. And I'll be honest with you, I've thought about that several times when I've gone through a drive through and people were just mean and hateful to me. But it's not all about dollars and cents and monetary value of things. It's, it's are we sharing good thoughts and words of encouragement. Pat shared this morning of a, a, a girl that she, uh, a friend of hers at a retirement party this week. And she didn't give her uh, any money, but she did give her words of encouragement that will help her, I think, in the days to come. So I want to ask each one of us today, how much is enough for us? You watch TV enough, you see enough financial commercials, they talk about that number. What's your number? What do you got to have to retire comfortably? What do you got to do to outlive your money? All kinds of financial commercials on television today. You have, uh, you've heard me talk about hearing a sermon, 1992, First United Methodist Church of Montgomery by the new incoming bishop, William Morris. Uh, I think at the time he was the first African American bishop in Alabama and in a predominantly white, huge cathedral church, it was um, kind of a milestone. Being in Montgomery, heart of the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King back in the 60s. So Bishop Mark Morris came in, and he preached on Isaiah chapter 6, 
And he sang a cappella uh, hymn, I think it's 493, Here I Am, Lord. He sang an a cappella. All the verses. Uh, one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my life. And, but going back, I remember the words that he closed with um, of his goal in his life, of his career, was that he was wanted to give a reverse tithe to the church. Never heard that term before. What do you mean by that? But I remember because it hit me right square between the eyes. He says, what I am trying to do in my life is I'm trying to give a reverse tithe to God. And that is to live on 10% of what I make and give 90% back to God. It's a reverse tithe, an opposite tithe, whatever you want to call it. But it's the opposite of what we talk about in church today. We live on the 90 and, and do our best to try to give back the 10. And that has always stuck with me over the last 24 years. Of what an admirable goal to try to attain to. Live on 10% of what you make. And give 90 back to God. Don't know if that's possible. But just the idea of it. Leads me to believe that, that Bishop William Morris. Will never be guilty of what James and Timothy have warned us about today. I don't believe. Now, I don't know that any of us would ever be able to attain that here in our lives. But it's a lofty goal. Maybe we could live on 50 and give 50. Maybe we could live on 70 and give 30. But it's something to think about. So as we live in a world that's, let's just call it for what it is, a world that's obsessed with money. Everything is about money. Probably every other story that you read about on the newspaper or see on television, it's got something to do with money. Money, 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 everything is about money. Well, Scripture's real clear. We came into this world with nothing. Whether you want to believe it or not, we're going to leave it with nothing. Naked I came into this world, naked I shall return. Money's necessary, got to have it. But the love of it will cause us more trouble than it's worth. So as we go through the rest of our lives, a good question to ask ourselves is how much is enough? And I would be willing to bet that all of us, if we set our minds to it, could live on less. I know I'm as guilty as anyone. But it all boils down to how do we treat one another and how do we treat God? Do we give people what they deserve according to what the Bible says? Do we give God what he deserves according to what the Bible says? So my challenge to each one of us is this. 
Let's not let money get the best of us. Let's be generous. Try to be generous like God has been generous to us. If you would, let's bow our heads. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all the blessings that you've sent our way, especially the money that you have given us to live on and to survive. I thank you for allowing us the, the energy and the strength to work hard for it. Lord, I thank you for blessing us with opportunities. Thank you for blessing us with employers that provided those jobs for us. But Lord, in the future, from this day forward, I pray that you would purge from us any obsession that we have with the love of money. And that we should turn that obsession on being thankful and loving you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.